This Sunday, pole vault. When we fight, we win. With just six weeks until Election Day, Vice President Kamala Harris is leading former President Donald Trump in our new NBC News poll. We are the underdog in this race. And we have some hard work ahead of us. We don't need votes. What we need is honesty in the election. Which side is more energized in the final sprint of the campaign? Steve Kornacki will break down the results. Plus, controversial comments. We are staying in this race. We are in to win. The Republican nominee for governor in North Carolina vows to stay in the race after reports revealed he once called himself a black Nazi and defended slavery on a porn site. We got folks running as Republicans for governor that are proud to refer themselves as Nazis. How will it impact Republicans' chances in this critical battleground state? And escalating attacks. Israel targets Hezbollah leaders inside Lebanon after a wave of attacks targeting the militant group's communication devices. Is the war spreading into a wider conflict? My guest this morning, Democratic Senator John Fetterman of Pennsylvania and Republican Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina. Joining me for insight and analysis are NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander, Amy Walter, Editor-in-Chief of the Cook Political Report, former Democratic Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy, and former Republican Congressman Carlos Curbelo. Welcome to Sunday. It's Meet the Press. From NBC News in Washington, the longest running show in television history, this is Meet the Press with Kristen Welker. Good Sunday morning. We begin with our brand new NBC News poll and the headline, Vice President Harris is leading former President Trump nationally by five points, 49 to 44 percent among registered voters. That is within the margin of error. But it's a shift from our last poll in July when Mr. Trump led President Biden by two points before Biden's exit from the race. This week, both candidates crisscrossed key battleground states. If Kamala Harris is reelected, she will kill the American dream forever. She's not competent to be president either, but, you know, I don't want to be rude. Someone who suggests we should terminate the Constitution of the United States should never again stand behind the seal of the president of the United States. There's a dramatic change in how positively voters view Harris. Her 21-point net swing from negative to positive is unmatched by a major party candidate in NBC News polling going back to 1989. And Harris is winning the change argument by nine points. Steve Kornacki will take us through the numbers just moments from now. Also this morning, sources are telling NBC News former President Trump is facing calls from his allies and from within his own campaign to pull his endorsement from scandal-plagued North Carolina gubernatorial candidate Mark Robinson after Mr. Trump's past support. This is Martin Luther King on steroids, okay? Now, Robinson did not attend a rally Mr. Trump held in North Carolina on Saturday. Mr. Trump didn't mention Robinson, and so far there are no plans for the former president to drop his endorsement. On Thursday, CNN reported Robinson, who is currently the state's lieutenant governor, posted a series of comments on the message board of a pornography website more than a decade ago, including referring to himself as a black Nazi and expressing support for reinstating slavery. Mr. Robinson has said that the online posts are fakes generated by artificial intelligence. Those are not the words of Mark Robinson. Clarence Thomas famously once said he was the victim of a high-tech lynching. Well, it looks like Mark Robinson is too. The Harris campaign is already out with a new ad tying former President Trump to Robinson on the issue of abortion. He's been an unbelievable Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson. For me, there is no compromise on abortion. Abortion in this country is about killing a child because you aren't responsible enough to keep your skirt down. I've been with him a lot. I've gotten to know him and he's outstanding. NBC Philadelphia's Lauren Make spoke to Mr. Trump's running mate, Senator J.D. Vance, on Saturday. 
Are you comfortable with uh, Mark Robinson as the Republican nominee for governor in North Carolina? Well, look, the allegations are pretty far out there, of course, but I know that allegations aren't necessarily reality. And what I'd say is it's ultimately up to Mark Robinson in North Carolina whether he's going to be their governor and whether he wants to stay in the race. Do you believe him that those were not his posts? Uh, I, I don't not believe him. I don't believe him. I just think that you have to let these things sometimes play out in the court of public opinion. For her part, Harris, who is trying to court moderate swing voters on Thursday, sat down in Michigan with Oprah Winfrey and talked about immigration and gun violence. Some people have been pushing a really false choice to suggest you're either in favor of the Second Amendment or you want to take everyone's guns away. I'm in favor of the Second Amendment and I'm in favor of assault weapons bans, universal background checks, red flag laws. I'm a gun owner. Tim Walls is a gun. I did not know that. <laughs> if somebody and I that breaks in my house, they're getting shot. With just 44 days until Election Day, in-person early voting is already underway in three states, Virginia, South Dakota, and Minnesota. For more on our brand new NBC News poll, I am joined now by national political correspondent Steve Kornacki to take us through all of the numbers. Steve, a lot of headlines here. Certainly, Kristen. I mean, you're looking at the biggest. Harris 49, Trump 44, five-point advantage for Harris in this poll against Donald Trump. And if we zoom out here and look at the bigger significance of this finding, you know, we've been polling the 2024 race going back to last year. And you can see here, these are all the results on the left side of the screen from when Joe Biden Biden was still the Democratic candidate. And now you see this is our first poll since Harris switched in. And look at that result. You can see that the race has been completely reshaped since Harris took the top of the ticket. Completely. And one of the things powering that lead, we should know, too, there's a pretty pronounced gender gap at this point. Harris among women is leading in our poll by 21 points. Among men, Trump is leading by 12. That is a 33 point gender gap. That's enormous what we're seeing right here. Uh, take a look at this, too. The debate, of course, course happening in the last couple of weeks, uh, nearly 30 percent saying that debate made them more likely to support Harris. Much smaller number for Trump. That might be helping her as well here. And then there's this, the view, the overall perception of Kamala Harris. Remember, before she got in the race, a lot of talk that, you know, her numbers didn't look better than Biden's. She was 32 positive, 50 negative before getting in this race. And now this is what you see. And we have to pause here because this is the largest increase that we have seen for any politician since George W. Bush in the wake of the September 11th attacks on yeah, this issue. Yeah, absolutely, Kristen. I mean, we were seeing numbers like this for years for Kamala Harris. Now you're seeing a very different story. And what goes into that, that new uh, uh, level of, uh, of uh, popularity she has? Take a look here, if we can. There it is. Call this up here. Some of the groups that have gravitated the most towards Harris, just in terms of favorable, look at this. Black voters, 24-point increase. Independents, 20. Young voters, 26. Young voters, this is a group where Joe Biden, when he was still in, he was putting up very, very poor numbers for a Democrat with Harris. You could see a 26 point jump there in her favorable score uh, among voters under 30. And then look at it this way. Just put it in comparison with Biden and then with all of the other national candidates this year. She's the only one Kamala Harris right now in our poll with a higher positive score than a negative score. Compare that to Trump. And by the way, at the bottom of this list, look at J.D. Vance, Trump's running mate, the lowest positive score. But you have to look at that 53 percent for Trump, the highest negative rating of everyone here. There it yeah. is. Yeah. The only one over 50 percent majority there. Take a look at some of the issues here. We ask folks, what is the most important issue here? You've got inflation, you know, number one here. Also the economy. I mean, add together, you know, inflation and the economy. You're talking about 40 percent of the electorate citing that. And take a look at this. We talked about when Trump was running against Biden, he had some pretty strong advantages on the issues. Well, this was Trump versus Biden. That's what you're seeing right here. This is Harris versus Biden. And look, Trump still has an advantage on the economy. It's nine points right now. It used to be 22. On the border, it's 21 now. That's a big advantage. It used to be 35. Look at this one. We talked about, remember, age being such a big issue? Yeah. Trump had a 29-point advantage over Joe Biden on the necessary mental, physical health. Now, Harris, 20-point advantage over Trump. It's so fascinating because Republican sources say if former President Trump would stick to the issues like immigration and the economy, he'd be doing better. And this shows it. It does. I mean, there's an opportunity there for him. Uh, and, you know, Harris, that's part of the success she's had in taking the lead has been eroding that. Okay, but look at it this way. A lot of positive news here for Democrats and for Kamala Harris, but if you're a Republican looking at these numbers, look back to October 2020. 
It's very similar. You know, we say Harris has jumped into a three point, you know, net positive rating. That's where Joe Biden was in October 2020. Trump is pretty much in the same place, a little bit worse in terms of views of him as 2020. But here's the other difference. In 2020, Trump was the incumbent president. 60% of people thought the country was on the wrong track. Now Harris is part of an incumbent administration, and two-thirds say the country's on the wrong track. In 2020, Trump came within really a handful of votes in a few states of winning in that in the Electoral College. You know, as the challenger against the incumbent administration, maybe overall not that much of a different uh, setup here, certainly in the Electoral College, within reach for him. Just a fascinating finding, Steve, with just six weeks to go. Here it is. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. And joining me now is Senator John Fetterman of Pennsylvania. Senator Fetterman, welcome back to Meet the Press. Hi, it's great to be here. Hi. Well, it is great to have you. Let's start with the results of our NBC News poll, which shows that Vice President Harris is leading former President Trump by five points nationally. Still, almost two-thirds of voters say household incomes are falling behind compared to inflation. Why should Pennsylvania voters trust that Harris can turn things around when so many voters say they don't feel the results of the Biden-Harris policies, Senator? Yeah, well, it, it, it's a five points, so, I mean, that's encouraging. But now I'm not going to say, well, now I don't have to drive for four and a half hours uh, to have with uh, a rally for Democrats in a, a rural counties. Uh, so uh, it's going to be very close, and you're going to see the polls. The Washington Post had a poll that I think is effectively tied, and the other kinds, just like yours, has Harris up. But regardless, uh, I promise you, Pennsylvania is going to be very close, and Otherwise, if it's not, it's going to be a great, nice surprise. But I'm expecting a, a very close and very competitive race through. Yeah, it, it usually is in Pennsylvania. I want to shift now to North Carolina, another incredibly competitive state. Mark Robinson, the Republican nominee for governor, as you know, there reportedly made incredibly controversial posts on a pornographic website. Now, he's denied making those posts Former President Trump has not dropped his endorsement of Robinson. And I wonder if you think it is fair for voters to judge a candidate based on who they endorse, Senator. Well, uh, of course. Uh, but, uh, I mean, it's it's great news for, for the Democrats. I mean, Robinson is, is actually, he, he's the new dream candidate to run against. Uh, back in 2018, I, I thought the Governor Wolf and I, I thought Scott Wagner was the dream candidate we could run, and we smoked him by 17 points. And then, of course, Doug Mastriano came on in 22, and that's the best kind of Republican candidate that you could buy, and, and the Shapiro campaign spent millions of dollars to promote him as well, too. But then Robinson's like, hey, hold my beer. <laughs> And now, of course, Trump's not going to walk back just because he's never going to admit what a disaster that is. But I, I'm, it's nice to know that he's going to win probably uh, as a Democratic governor. But I'm not sure the impact that it will have at the top line. But it would be wonderful and almost ball game if Harris wins uh, North Carolina. But she's made North Carolina competitive already. And then after Robinson, now uh, it's we're in the best possible situation to win. Let me ask you about another topic, the second apparent assassination attempt against former President Trump this week. This is what his running mate, J.D. Vance, had to say in the wake of it. Take a look. The big difference between conservatives and liberals is that we ha no one has tried to kill Kamala Harris in the last couple of months, and two people now have tried to kill Donald Trump in the last couple of months. I'd say that's pretty strong evidence that the left needs to to tone down the rhetoric and needs to cut this crap out. Somebody's going to get hurt by it. Senator, what's your response to Senator J.D. Vance? I, I don't know. Who's actually listening to what, what Vance says. <laughs> it's been months already. No one's not really listening to him anymore. Uh, you know, he has de developed a kind of reputation to say dumb things, pointless things, and offend everybody. And he's been picked as the most unpopular pick in history. But no one's listening to him. I'm certainly not. Uh, and we're here we are right now. To the substance of his charge, though, he'd say, I'd say that's pretty strong evidence that the left needs to tone down the rhetoric and needs to cut this blank out. How do you respond to that specific part of what he says? 
Now, that, that's absolutely absurd. Every Democrat condemned uh, the ass assassination attempts, and I did as well, too. And, I, you know, they're talking about eating the dogs and saying outlandish kind of things. Uh, now, let's just have a serious conversation uh, about this election, not talking about that kind of empty, empty kind of rhetoric from somebody like J.D. Vance. I want to ask you about something that Vice President Kamala Harris said this week. Uh, she was talking about gun ownership with Oprah Winfrey. She said, quote, if somebody breaks into my house, they're going to get shot. You, Senator, are a gun owner. As the leader of a party that prides itself on advocating for gun safety, was it responsible for Vice President Harris to make those comments? Uh, absolutely. I think I think the vast majority of Americans, if you had somebody breaking into your house that might be there to, to harm you, you probably have the right to, to, to shoot them. And I think that's the vast, vast majority of Americans would agree with that. All right. Well, let me talk about a big issue, another big issue, I should say, in your state, the issue of fracking. I know you've talked about this quite a bit. Vice President Harris, as you know, once supported a ban on fracking when she was running for president in 2020. She even sued the Obama administration to prevent fracking off California's coast. Now she says she will not ban the practice as president. Why should voters trust that that is really what the vice president believes? It's so strange why we just keep talking about fracking. Now, back in 2020, I said that it, that might be an issue, but it's not going to be a defining issue. And now in 2024, we're still trying to talk about fracking. And now the other side, they're talking about eating cats and geese and dogs and saying absurd things and, and talking about how if Trump doesn't win, he said that, you know, you have to blame the Jews on that and just absurd things, you know, like having a, a serious policy conversation when the other side is just absolutely on fire. And here's where we are. But and here we are also that it's going to be very close in Pennsylvania and it's not going to be defined by fracking. Well, and well, we are talking about it because, of course, it supported 120,000 jobs back in 2022. Let me read you some of what you have said about fracking. In 2016, you called it a stain on Pennsylvania. In 2018, you said you don't support fracking at all. But then in 2022, you said you absolutely support fracking. Senator, what exactly do you like about fracking now? Uh, it, it's strange for some a weird gotcha kind of taking uh, quotes out of out of context. And, you know, here I am now, I'm a United States senator, and I won by five points, a record margin back in 22. And again, it might be an issue in fracking, and I fully support fracking. So does the vice president Harris. And now if you want to have a serious conversation about policy, then I would challenge Trump and Vance to have one other than talking about eating uh, pets. And we'll have plenty of questions uh, for, for Senator Lindsey Graham. There's no doubt about that. But to the point, what do you now like about fracking? You say you're not going to ban it. You support it now. Uh oh, <laughs> they're eating dogs. They're eating cats. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, again, so, okay. Yes, and any more on fracking? I think, I think. Well, I want to ask you about the Middle East, actually. Let's move on, because I do want to get this in. This week, as you know, a new front opened in the war in the Middle East, jeopardizing ceasefire talks. Senator Bernie Sanders accused Prime Minister Netanyahu of sabotaging a deal. Take a look at what he said. Every time a deal appears close Netanyahu moves the goalposts, introducing new demands and torpedoing the deal. It is clear to me that Netanyahu is prolonging the war in order to cling to power. Senator, you have stood firmly behind Israel, but do you agree with any part of what your colleague Senator Sanders said there? No, not, not, not at all. And I want to be very clear. I, I thought what Israel chose to do about blowing up the pagers and then walkie-talkies and then after targeting and eliminating membership and leadership of Hezbollah, I absolutely support that. And in fact, if anything, I love it. And, and Israel demonstrated that they will not allow terrorists not to be held accountable. And I fully support that. And it's not about nothing that has what my colleague has said. All right, Senator Fetterman, it is always great to talk to you. Really appreciate your being on this morning.
When we come back, Republican Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina joins me next. Welcome back. And Republican Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina joins me now. Senator Graham, welcome back to Meet the Press. Happy anniversary. Thank you very much. And they said it wouldn't last. Uh, one year in the chair. Thank you for and being here. And a three here. and a half month old. That's a lot right. going on in your house. That's yeah. for sure. Thank you for being here yeah, so thank frequently. You. Thank you for being here in person today. Glad to be. Really appreciate it. Let's start talking about the embattled gubernatorial candidate <laughs> yeah. in North Carolina, Mark Robinson. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's alleged that he put these posts up, very controversial on a pornographic mm. website. He says he didn't do it. Former President Donald Trump spoke yesterday in North Carolina, didn't mention him, yeah. has not dropped his endorsement. Senator, do you think that former President Trump should drop his endorsement of Mark Robinson? I think what's going to happen here is that he deserves a chance to defend himself, Mark Robinson. The charges are beyond unnerving. Uh, if they're true, he's unfit to serve for office. If they're not true, he has the best lawsuit in the history of the country for libel. He's claiming they were artificially created and that CNN passed it along to be true. Has NBC confirmed this? Not yet. We're, we're all looking okay. into it. Well, so what I would do if I were him, I would hire me the best lawyer I could find. I'd sue the hell out of CNN because what they're saying about him is just unbelievable. Now, he needs to do more, in my view. He has a right to defend himself. He has an obligation to defend himself. This is hanging over his campaign. Trump won in 2016 and 2020 when the governor candidate lost both times. I don't think this hurts Trump. But as to Robinson, he's a political zombie if he does not offer a defense to this that's credible. Senator, these uh, allegations, this story came out on Friday. He has yeah. had multiple days to defend himself. He has not produced one shred of evidence. And as you know, he's right. had plenty of other highly controversial comments in the past, including saying, let's stop talking yeah. about Hitler and the Nazis. Do you think he could cost Trump North Carolina? Uh, no, I really don't, because Trump won when the governor candidate lost in 2016 and 2020. But here's what's important. I'm in South Carolina. I see the ads every 15 seconds. This is a major allegation by a major news organization that needs to be addressed. He has not only a right to de defend himself, but an obligation to defend himself. At the very least, should former President Trump pull his endorsement or make it clear that he's distancing himself? I think what you're going to see happen here is Robinson is going to have to deal with it. There's nothing, uh, no accusation involving Trump. It's all about Robinson. You asked a good question. Should every Republican in the country uh, be held responsible for this guy, I would say no. Uh, it's him, not me. It's not Trump. He's the one that supposedly said these things. He has a right to defend himself. He needs to defend himself. All right, let's move on to some of your activity this week. You traveled to Nebraska, one of only two yeah. states that awards its electoral votes by congressional district instead of winner take all. Right. That, as you know, could be decisive in Absolutely. this election. It awarded Joe Biden, for example, one electoral vote in the Omaha area back in 2020. You met with state lawmakers mm -hmm. to persuade them to change to a winner take all system. Right. Here's what Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer had to say about this trip earlier today, earlier this week. Look, they're very worried about the election, as they should be. The American people every day see the contrast. They can't win legitimately, so they always try to change the rules at the last minute. Senator, you've seen the <laughs> results of our poll. Can Donald Trump win if you don't change the rules in well, Nebraska? This is really number one. Uh, Sixty-five percent of the people in your poll say the country's on the wrong track. Who's best able to uh, solve the crime pay, uh, problem? Trump by six. Who's best on the economy? Trump by nine. Inflation? Trump by eight. Border? Trump by 21. So what did I get out of this poll? On the things that matter most to the American people, Trump is winning decisively in a head-to-head. -head, he is not. Now I know why the Teamsters voted the way they did. The Teamsters have endorsed every Democratic candidate for president for the last 30 years, except Harris. They must believe 
like the American people, she is not good on the issues that matter most of the Teamsters. That's the only explanation, is that she lost the endorsement of the Teamsters for the first time in 30 years. Why? Because she's bad on the issues they care about. Given what you're saying, though, if she's not good on these issues, why do you need to change the rules in Nebraska? I think Nebraska has been talking about this for years. It is a very close election. 63 days ago, Chuck Schumer... Uh, led a coup to overthrow Joe Biden, and he's telling me or any other Republican we, what we should be doing. If they change the law in Nebraska, it won't be in, under, on the phone in the middle of the night. It will be through a democratic process. The entire federal delegation of Nebraska, House members and two senators, want this change. To my friends in Nebraska, yeah. that one electoral vote could be the difference between Harris being president or not, and she's a disaster for Nebraska and the world. I hear you're calling it a coup. Of course, Democrats have the right to change who's <laughs> oh, yeah. at the top so of the ticket. So does, so very does Nebraska. Quickly, very quickly, before we get to the Middle East, what do you think the chances are? What's the over-under that this change actually happens in Nebraska? 50-50, okay. down to two people. Okay, let's go to the Middle East now. The U.S., okay. as you know, is trying to avoid an escalation of the conflict between Israel and Lebanon after, frankly, a new front yeah. in this war opened up this week. And there are real concerns that Prime Minister Netanyahu will go into Lebanon as yeah. soon as next week. Should he pull back? Should he de-escalate? This is a dream scenario for Iran. They're trying to suck um, Bibi and Israel into a fight. October the 7th was designed to stop normalization. Trump did the Abraham Accords. Biden's been working to get Saudi Arabia to recognize Israel. That's a nightmare for Iran. So October the 7th was designed to stop that. It was so horrific. Now you see a front opening in the north. So here's what I would tell my friends in Israel. Do not give up on normalization with Saudi Arabia. I know you got to deal with Hezbollah. There was an imminent attack. But two things, one of two things have to change in the Mideast. We need to make game-changing peace, which is reconciliation between Saudi Arabia and Israel, or game-changing military strategy. Go into Lebanon to establish a buffer zone. Won't work unless you hit Iran. To my friends in Israel, you're fighting the proxies. Fight the source, the great Satan, Iran. To the Biden administration, you've let run, Iran run wild. You've given them $80 billion of relief on sanctions. They're rich, they're running wild, and now's the time to hit the source of the problem, the Iranians. All right, let's talk about a another headline this week. Donald Trump was speaking at an Israeli-American council event. Uh, he did make waves because he seemed to suggest that Jewish voters would be to blame if he doesn't win the election, Senator. Listen to what he said. If I don't win this election, and the Jewish people would really have a lot to do with that if that happens, because at 40 percent, that means 60 percent of the people are voting for the enemy. The second gentleman, Doug Emhoff, said those comments were trafficking in tropes, scapegoating Jews. Is yeah. he right? How do you respond? I would tell President Trump that the Jewish American voter is probably concerned about the same thing that all other voters are to the Democratic Party. Why are you losing African-American men? Why are you losing ground with minorities? Rather than blaming them, you ought to convince them to vote for uh, Vice President Harris. My advice to President Trump is that the Jewish American voter, I'm sure they do care about Israel. There's been no better friend of Israel. But talk about crime. Talk about the economy. Talk about inflation. Talk about border. That's the way you persuade people in this country. We have an obligation to persuade people to vote for us. Very quickly on Ukraine, at the debate last week, Donald Trump was asked if he wants Ukraine to win the war, repeatedly pressed on this. He did not answer. What message does that send to Vladimir Putin that he couldn't say, yes, I want Ukraine to win? What does winning look like? Here's what I think will happen if President Trump wins. He will end this war. The biggest mistake the Biden administration has made stopping natural gas exports to Europe. They were against the Keystone Pipeline, Harris. And for the uh, Nord Stream but, 2 pipeline. Senator, quickly, because we're almost out of time. Does it concern you that he can't just say, yes, I want to see no, Ukraine very, win? Does that not send a mixed message that, to Putin? It concerns me that Ukraine was invaded uh, on Biden's watch. It concerns me that uh, the Iran's running wild on Biden's watch. It didn't happen on uh, Trump's watch. Harrison and Biden are a disaster. 
Ukraine was invaded Ukraine, by Russian. But on Russia, Iran is running wild, wreaking havoc. So, no, I am confident Donald Trump will change things. If you want the world to change and you elect Harris, nothing's going to change. Were you happy with that answer, Senator? Were you happy with that answer? No, I'm, I'm okay with the answer of not telling what winning looks like. I am confident he will not reward Putin. But here's what I would say to the American people. If you think we're on the wrong track, you're right. If you think Kamala Harris is going to change things, you're wrong. She has her foot, uh, fingerprints on Afghanistan. She said on the sidelines, she boycotted BB's speech. The Iranians see her as weak. Uh, the Russians see her, her as weak. Do you think it's an accident? The world's on fire. The border is broken. Inflation is through the roof. She's not going to change things. She's going to make things worse. Right. And that's what our poll shows. All right. Senator Lindsey thank Graham, you. thank you very much again for being here in person. We really appreciate it. When we come back, Vice President Harris's favorability rating rises 16 points in just two months. And she's winning the battle as the candidate who represents change. Our panel is next. Welcome back. The panel is here. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander, co-anchor of Weekend Today. Amy Walter, editor-in-chief of the Cook Political Report. Former Democratic Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy of Florida, president of the Center Isle Coalition, and former Republican Congressman Carlos Curbelo of Florida. We have the Florida contingent here. Thanks to all of you for being here. Peter, I want you to kick this off, and let's delve into some of these really stunning numbers that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. Vice President Kamala Harris with a 16-point swing, up 16 points from where she was in July in her favorability rating. Unprecedented in our poll. What is the Harris campaign strategy to keep building this momentum? Well, well, I think, for one, I don't know that they necessarily trust that these numbers are numbers they're going to rely on. They yeah. still view this as going to be very tight in the states where this matters most right now. And to that point in particular, from my conversations with those in the Harris campaign, they're very focused on those hard to reach voters right now. In particular, they describe them to me as people who are younger. They are mostly male and they are racially diverse right now. In particular, they're trying to have multiple touch points as they describe it with these people, not just to introduce themselves to them once, to have them see their ads once, but as many times as they can. And to that point, they're trying to get them where they are. College football games. I was watching mm. some football yesterday. Big win for Michigan, I have to say. Um, <laughs> there were several Harris ads you saw throughout the course of, of yesterday. And also, I wouldn't be surprised if they start showing up on sports betting sites as well. One other group to watch, Kristen, worth noting, non-college educated white women as well. They think that they can gain some ground in that yeah. community, too. It is about finding voters in all of those unique spaces that yep, Peter's yep. talking about, yep. Amy. One of the other big headlines is that Harris is up by nine points when we asked who is the change candidate. She's currently in the White House, yes, so it's just extraordinary vice president that and she's is. made this argument. Yeah. What's behind that, and what are your key takeaways? Well, my key speakers? takeaways from this is that she's been able to change this from a race that was a referendum on Joe Biden to a race that is a referendum on Donald Trump. And what's remarkable to me beyond the favorable numbers, when you look at the questions of who do you think could serve as commander in chief, who do you think will be capable and effective? She has been able to not just move into the positive mm. um, column there, but she's on the issue of competent and effective. She's seen she's moved 23 points from where Biden was. I mean, this was a big advantage for Trump going into the election uh, when Biden was the nominee. So the ability, once again, to make this, as I said, to make this race now, not so much about the Biden administration, but about Trump himself. And look, um, I think uh, the senator said this as well, that where Trump does have an advantage continues to be the economy. Mm -hmm. But even mm -hmm. on the economy, that nine point advantage, not only is it much smaller than he had over uh, uh, Biden, but it's basically tied with where the NBC poll had this race in 2020 yeah. on the issue of the economy. It does look a lot like 2020 if you look at these numbers. Yeah. Stephanie, one of the things that's so fascinating is that uh, when you think about an issue like the economy, Vice President Harris has been rolling out some of her economic policies, but she's not filling in every single blank for voters. Is this, do you think, a strategy that's working or does she need to be more out front? She obviously did the event with Oprah this past week, but does she need to do more? I think the Harris campaign in a very short amount of time have run an incredibly 
disciplined campaign. And it's working for them. They've introduced her to the voters. They really focus on her values, and they've sprinkled in a little bit of policy. But at the end of the day, voters vote on values. They want to know that this candidate cares about them, can feel their pain, and has the vision for leadership. And based on the numbers so far, that is resonating with voters. And so while swing voters still say they want more policy, do they really? And Mm. when you get into the policy details, you're getting into the weeds and you lose your top line messaging. So I think more of the same. Carlos, all of this comes as we are, of course, tracking this controversy swirling around North Carolina's gubernatorial candidate, Mark Robinson. Senator Lindsey Graham said he thinks Trump can still win North Carolina. What say you? What are your sources telling you about how much concern there is inside Democratic circles about this? Well, Kristen, I think the word discipline is really uh, the one we should focus on here. We look at these numbers and the change is drastic, but Is it really that surprising? I mean, Donald Trump's campaign has been surrounded by so many distractions, Mm. and this one in North Carolina is just the most recent ones. We heard Senator Graham. We always hear his surrogates on TV pleading with him to focus on the issues, on the economy, on immigration. He has forfeited his lead on these issues, not to take anything away from Vice President Harris. She has run a very disciplined campaign, but Donald Trump has done the opposite. And this controversy in North Carolina, look, They can still win North Carolina. They might, but they're going to have to spend limited resources there, and that gives another advantage to the Harris campaign. Just a reminder, as we talk about North Carolina, this is a state that Joe Biden lost by 1.3% four years ago. This is a close state right now. And about Mark Robinson, this wasn't just predictable. This was predicted. And in talking to smart Republicans in North Carolina just yesterday, they asked two questions right now. Have we seen everything? Remember Madison Cawthorn uh, <laughs> yeah. a couple I'm of years ago? Not necessarily. This thing yeah. took not just days, it took weeks. Yeah. This could marinate. We could yeah. be dealing with this for yeah. a while now. And separately, how is this going to impact Donald Trump? Republicans right. are going to vote for Donald Trump. Democrats are going to vote for Kamala Harris. But there are 440,000 new unaffiliated voters mm-hmm. in North Carolina since 2020. And one of the things to keep an eye on, you may not think about about North Carolina, there are more HBCU, historically black college undergrads in the state of North Carolina than in any other state in the country. Amy, what about that? What about those figures that Peter cites, those unaffiliated voters who are up for grabs right now? Yeah. So you look at North Carolina, it's true, with 74,000 votes, the difference in 2020 between uh, Biden winning and Biden losing. And I don't know. I, I'm always skeptical to think that there is uh, reverse coattails. In other words, that the bottom of the ticket impacts the top of the ticket. Where I think it becomes a factor, though, young voters have uh, not, if you if you look at the data, they have not turned out at the rate that Democrats would need them to be in order to really give them that advantage. And is this an issue Mm. that's going to pull them out? In other words, it's not that this is the issue that they're going to turn against Trump while they're already voting. It's is seeing this one more reason for them to show up and vote. And while they're there, they vote for it. Mitch McConnell has been talking to Republicans about candidate quality for about 15 Mm. years. Lesson yet to be learned. Yeah. All right. We'll come back. We'll have a lot more with the panel, a lot more to chew on. But when we come back, the threat of political violence hangs over the 2024 race. Former President Trump is not the first Secret Service protectee to be the target of multiple assassination attempts. Our Meet the Press Minute is next. Welcome back. Former President Trump survived a second apparent assassination attempt in just over two months. A shocking event for a nation all too familiar with repeated threats on the lives of its leaders. President Gerald Ford also survived two attempts within weeks. In 1975, a member of the Charles Manson family cult tried to assassinate Ford in Sacramento. 17 days later, he faced another attempt in San Francisco. William E. Simon joined Meet the Press two days after the attempt. He was the Secretary of the Treasury, which at the time meant he oversaw the U.S. Secret Service. New York Times editorial yesterday stated that, quote, it is startling after the Secret Service tightening of its procedures in the wake of the assassinations of the 1960s that a vociferous member of the Manson family would wander so easily into the path of a strolling president. What's your response to that comment? Do you have any plans for reviewing uh, the Secret Service procedures? The Secret Service procedures uh, are as adequate as any procedures can be in carrying out their duties of protecting the various people that they protect by law. 
and they carry it out uh, in a way that uh, I think is as professional, if not more professional, than any other agency in the world in carrying out these duties. When we come back, early voting is already underway, but are Republicans looking to make some last minute changes to election rules? More with the panel next. And welcome back. The panel is still here. Peter, you had a chance to speak exclusively with the First Lady this week. You talked about the transition of power. What did she actually let's play a little bit of that interview and then get your reaction on the other side. I think we have to come together. I think we have to uh, vote as Americans. You know, that's a right that we've been given. And I think we have to take advantage of that. And then we have to have a peaceful transfer of power. What was your takeaway from what she told you? Well, notably, this was the first time we've had a chance to speak to the First Lady since her husband got out of this race about his decision. She said, I am totally at peace, and so is he on that. She acknowledged a bit of relief that he doesn't have the weight on him that he mm. would have had as a presidential candidate. Now he's been in politics for so many years. Uh, finally, he can help support another candidate in some form. Also spoke about political violence a bit, was expressing her gratitude and praise for the Secret Service for the job they've done, saying that she does not feel any fear. The one thing I will say in terms of reporting, a little nugget from speaking to her team over the course of this last week, is that they reminded me that she is a homegrown girl from Philadelphia and that you will soon see her on the trail for Kamala Harris in her hometown of Philly. Oh, that is a good nugget. All right, well, we will look for that. Stephanie, you know, Peter's conversation comes as we are doing all of this reporting on what's happening inside these states. I just talked to Senator Lindsey Graham about Nebraska, but let's start off by talking about Georgia, where the state election board just voted three to two to basically say that all votes that are machine counted have to be hand counted as well. What are the implications of this? Brad Raffensperger saying this could create chaos. Yeah, so our system is antiquated and difficult to understand because it's different from one state to the next. And by having Georgia have to hand count ballots, it uh, doubles down on that antiquated part, but it also creates opportunity to sow uh, misinformation. We found in mm. the January 6th committee that those uh, differences between the way states count votes and when they announce were used to sow doubt on the outcome of the election. And when average Americans were lied to by powerful people, they showed up on January 6th and engaged in acts of political violence. And I think we really have to brace ourselves knowing that there's quite a few number of lawsuits already filed around all elements of um, voting, and um, it feels like there's a foundation being laid for contesting the outcome of this election. Carlos, what do you make of it? So, look, this is probably going to make the post-election messy again, mm. and, and messy comes with risk, right? But can we talk about what it does now to the race? It makes the race about the past. It makes Donald Trump's campaign about the yep. 2020 yeah. election. This is why Republicans didn't have a red wave in 2022, because 2022 was about 2020. And Donald Trump is making 2024 about 2020. So this is yet another example of how lack of discipline is costing Donald Trump and how the focus isn't on the issues where he has a clear advantage. Well, and that's that be careful of what you ask for. The more the conversation is about... Are they going to change the rules at the last minute in Nebraska? They're changing the rules in Georgia. Does that encourage those who maybe weren't interested in voting uh, for Kamala Harris, but they really didn't want to see Donald Trump elected? Now they come out to vote. Yeah. Anytime that Donald Trump's in the news, yes, it helps motivate his base, but boy, does it well, and what put about rocket the camp, fuel on the, the camp other side. Republicans in Georgia, right? Yeah. This, this well, that certainly right. has an effect on them, too. And that's he right. did this um, in the two Senate races and those specials. That's right. And Democrats ended up winning those. Senate seats in Georgia. We should That's say there's right. a very delicate alliance right now between Kemp <laughs> and Trump, yeah. and anything could potentially send it in the wrong direction. But, Peter, let's talk about Nebraska. You heard Senator Lindsey right. Graham defend his trip there and say, uh, look, he has every right to be there. The Democrats changed who was at the top of their tippet. But the optics of this, yes. does it not essentially suggest that Trump is feeling really nervous? Let's be clear. This would be a last-minute change to the way it has been for the last three decades here. Yeah. And let's also be clear that right now they don't have the votes that they need to do to make this change right now, even though Donald Trump is directly engaging in this process in some form. But the big picture reminder here is that 
every electoral vote could matter this go around, yeah. right? So this is still going to be a tight race, and those slim margins, a little change like that could be a difference maker. Well, and it's also a sign of a campaign that's been on defense mm -hmm. and continues to be on defense. I don't know the last time that it felt as if the Trump campaign were actually playing offense. Mm. Um, this is what you do when you feel like, um, well, we may not be winning, and so <laughs> that's not a sign of a confident campaign. Yeah, I mean, Stephanie, you know, Lindsey Graham said chances are 50-50, as Peter notes. They just don't have the votes right now. At the same time, Democrats are watching this closely because that one electoral vote was important to Joe Biden's victory in 2020. It could be decisive, depending on how the chips fall. It could be decisive when if it gets thrown back to the House, all the per permutations oh. of what happens if um, the uh, vote has to go to the House, where it's one state, one vote. Um, so there's a lot about the way that our elections are structured and the way the elections are playing out this cycle that uh, leads me to believe that it might be a really sporty few <laughs> months after uh, November yeah. 5th. And, Carlos, just that looking forward, given all of this and given what Amy is saying about former President Trump effectively being on defense right now, what do you think the strategy is to get on offense? Is there one, based on your conversations? Look, in some ways, he should maybe emulate what uh, Vice President Harris has done. She has pivoted to the center, a true mm -hmm. and tested strategy in American politics. Donald Trump keeps pivoting to the past. He's trying to max his base. His base, I mean, it's powerful. We can't underestimate it. And he can still win this race, no question. Yeah. But his base has fallen short three general elections in a row. He has to grow from his base, and he's doing nothing to achieve that. And our poll yet again shows what is shaping up to be an historic gender gap, Amy. Right. And we don't know exactly who is going to turn out. I mean, that is the question. Any of us could know that today of who's who is going to show up and vote. But who the most motivated is an important question. But then you ask the question. I don't think you had it on your poll, but I've seen in other polls asking voters who they think will win. And before uh, Biden got out of the race, not surprisingly, most voters saying they thought that Donald Trump was going to win. In polling that's been coming out now, Harris is seen as the more likely victor, which tells you a little bit about, once again, that the, the, the agenda in terms of who's controlling it has shifted appreciably to Harris's benefit. Yeah. And I think it's uh, notable, too, the number of new registrations that have yeah. um, registered to vote. And at, that's bringing new people into the political process, which is healthy. And uh, most of those people came, that bump came on the Democratic heels. All right, guys, great conversation. Hey, one year at Meet the Press. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you all for Happy being hours. here for You're this big welcome. Sunday and being a part of it. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thank you. That is all for today. Thank you for watching. We will be back next week because if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.